Hello, everyone. I am Caitlin Yeager, Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. We are a member-supported organization, and our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you so much for joining us for chapter three of this 10 part virtual storytelling journey that brings the book Growing Up With The River, Nine Generations On The Missouri to life. Growing Up With The River by Dan and Connie Burkhardt explores our state's rich cultural heritage through the eyes of nine generations of children growing up in river towns along the Missouri River. Each of the 10 chapters will be presented by a professional storyteller and special guest. The series will run every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live, ending on September 30th. Today, we will explore Herman. Herman was founded in 1837 and took advantage of its riverfront location and regular train service that arrived in the 1850s to become a bustling community. It was built by European immigrants, primarily from Germany. These settlers brought with them a new crop, grapes, that soon began to cover the hillside along the river. They also brought with them a strong opposition to slavery. Our chapter today will be presented by internationally known story performer, Bobby Norfolk, who has been called an adventure story come to life. Bobby was honored with an honorary doctorate of humane letters in 2018 by the University of Missouri, St. Louis, where he gave the commencement address to the College of Arts and Sciences. After Bobby's reading, we will introduce our special guest for this chapter. We'd once again like to thank Dan and Connie Burkhart for writing such a delightful book and for entrusting us to share these stories with you all. And also many thanks to artist Brian Haynes for allowing us to share his beautiful illustrations. Please let us know that you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments on the live stream and we'd be happy to answer those questions towards the end of the program. In partnership with the Higher Education Channel, HEC TV, St. Louis Storytelling Festival, Missouri History Museum, and Magnificent Missouri, we present Growing Up With The River. Bobby Norfolk here, and I would love to do a reading from the book. Just mentioned it was autographed by the authors and given to me at UNSO a few years ago. So thank you, Dan and Connie. Just across the river, people owned slaves. The boys had been told that Thousands of slaves lived in Montgomery County, but no slave owners were in Herman. But two years ago, Stephen Douglas, who was running for president against Abraham Lincoln, had gotten off the train in their county, Gasconade. Despite the brass band and the banners, the crowd wasn't enthusiastic. In fact, a boy, one of their best friends, shook the candidate's hand after the speech and said, Goodbye, Mr. Douglas but I don't think you'll be elected. <laughs> the crowd laughed at this, but he was right. And Abraham Lincoln had been elected. Now there was war. Pretty much all that anyone talked about was this in town. At church, in school, was the war. It was hard for the boys to think about attacks on their own town, so they tried not to. But they heard town people talk and it worried them. Since the Civil War had started the year before, the boys were under strict instructions to stay away from their old familiar hideouts down the footpaths that led through the village through the forest. There were Southern troops, bushwhackers, they were called. They were moving about the countryside near Herman. The local militia in town was alert, but who knew what could happen if they found two boys in the countryside? The boys pretended to be brave but the war was scary. Would they kidnap us? Maybe, his brother said, or they would force us to be soldiers and follow their orders. The boys tried to stay close to their house. One April day, they disobeyed the rule to stay out of the woods. It was a pretty day, and they walked about a mile past the edge of the town to an open hilltop where they could see the river and where they had once seen a bear cub. As the younger brother snapped a twig, they heard muffled voices in the distance. What's that? He whispered. Or who is that? His brother replied. As they pictured themselves captives in a Confederate prison. They flew down the path towards town, convinced that they had just escaped being bushwhacked. 
Now it was much easier for them to stay out of the woods. Most of the families in town had come from Germany, so everyone spoke German and they kept their traditions from the old country. For many, the land and the river near Hermann reminded them of the Rhineland, the Rhine River Valley in Germany. The hilly land in Missouri was less expensive and they said they had more opportunities. They built their homes and stores from brick and stone, planting vineyards and building cellars to store the wine made from their grapes. The boys had plenty of things to think about other than the war. Gold, for one. Uncle George had gone off to California years ago with dozens of other Herman men to prospect for gold and the gold rush. They came back with great ideas, some with money from their prospecting to make Herman a grand place to live. Herman always knew that it was destined to be an important town on the Missouri River. The founders of Herman had come from the German Settlement Society of Philadelphia, and they had big dreams. They had built their new Market Street wider than the Market Street back east, expecting to compete with St. Louis. The boys knew that dreams and big plans were welcome in their hometown. They were ready for an adventure, like gold or grapes. Vineyards covered many of the hillsides in and around the town. The hilly town was perfect for grapes, and the winemaker's hard work had led to many Herman wines winning prizes. All of their friends in school were proud to be in the race with New York and Ohio to be the top wine producer in the entire United States. Uncle George was leading the new agriculture society and was already well known for his excellent grapes and wine. Go grapes and pigeons. The boys looked forward to the days when enormous flocks of pigeons, carrier pigeons, would fly over Herman. So big were their flocks that the sky would darken on a sunny day. Father said that the flock was more than 200 miles long. 200 miles. The passenger pigeons that flew over Herman were part of a flock that stretched from Iowa to Arkansas. The boys had overheard men on the steamboat say that the pigeons were being shipped from St. Louis to restaurants in Boston and New York. It didn't seem possible that pigeons flying along the Missouri River were going to be dinner for somebody in New York City. As exciting as watching the pigeons was, the boys wished they could see the bright colored Carolina parakeets that used to roost in the sycamores along the river. Now that so many people had settled there, the forest had been cleared for crops and the beautiful green parakeets with their orange and yellow heads were no longer seen. Even father had only seen a few. The parakeets were no more than a memory and a dream now. Father rarely hunted, but many still hunted in the forest for turkey and deer to put on their dinner table. The miles and miles of oak forest produced so many acorns and wild fruits that the turkey and deer had lots of food and hunting, and that was easy even for a new immigrant. Cows and pigs ran free in the forest too. There were so many animals in and around Herman that town people built fences around their houses. They tried to keep the cows and pigs grazing near the creek out of their backyards and orchards, their carefully tended vegetable gardens. Meanwhile, steamboats arrived frequently at Herman's busy wharf, bringing goods and shipping out timber and iron ore, or taking on massive loads of firewood to keep their boilers going to provide the power to navigate the Missouri's strong current. Men cut and stacked large piles of wood at the river's edge for the boats to load for the fuel when they arrived. The steamboats carried all sorts of goods, more than anyone could ever see. Pots, pans, tools, all sorts of food, silk, perfume, nails, and clothing of all kinds. Artists who painted the river were often on the boats too. They set up their easels and painted pictures of things that seemed ordinary to the boys, but they used colors that were even more beautiful than real life. Sadly, the steamboats also brought problems. Many people in town, including their dear mother, had become ill from an outbreak of cholera 
that began when sick passengers were being put off the boat into Herman. A bench at school was empty because three of their schoolmates had died from cholera. A little sidebar here before I conclude. Stonehill Winery was one of the many Herman wineries in the mid 1800s. By the end of the 19th century, it had grown to be one of the largest wineries in America. Now, the National Storytelling Network, also known as NSN, had a national conference here several years ago in St. Louis County at Westport Plaza. And so two people, man and a woman, they were presenters for the storytelling conference here in St. Louis. And they were brought from the San Joaquin Valley of California. So we had some gift baskets ready for them. When the gift baskets were put in place in their rooms and they brought them down and they had this wine stone hill. What is this? <clears throat> A little bit of uh, arrogance there. But later on, when they took that top off, poured it, they were convinced they were made believers. They knew that the wines of Herman were equal, if not superior, to those of San Joaquin Valley. But I digress. For the first time, Herman's leaders decided that all children were required to attend the new school that had just been built. The boys studied maps of the Rhine River Valley so they could see where their parents were born. Classes were taught in both German and English so the boys could easily understand the Americans on the riverboats. Herman was surely becoming a great city and that grand house was one of its finest. It had been built before the boys were born in 1847. It looked directly at the wide river. The gardens of the house went all the way to the riverbank, interrupted only by the railroad tracks. From their large front porch, the boys could almost see their family's vineyards up on the high river bluff overlooking the valley. Today, they were playing marbles on the porch and hoping for a big sack of mail on the train. How exciting! It would be to receive a letter from across the Atlantic Ocean. Like many of their friends, they had grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins in Germany. The boys' parents had left everyone to start a new life. Now their relatives were worried about the war in America. Everyone wrote more letters to reassure one another because they were scary, scary times during that war. Reading letters from their grandma and papa in German was good practice too. The boys wrote back in German. Someday soon, they hoped, the war would end and slaves would be free and Herman would become an even more magical and exciting place to live. To conclude, the Arabia's last trip. One of the many steamboats regularly passing Herman was the Arabia, described in an 1854 newspaper article as the new, fast, and magnificent Arabia. The boat passed Herman for the last time. Heading west from St. Louis in early September 1856, and on September the 5th, Arabia hit a snag north of Kansas City and quickly sank to the bottom of the river where it stayed for 130 years. During those 130 years, the river channel shifted by one mile, and the Arabia was buried 45 feet under a cornfield. The wreckage and the cargo were salvaged in 1988, and a museum was created to display some of the 200 tons of cargo the boat carried. The museum illustrates the volume and the variety of the cargo on the steamboat headed to the frontier. On display are 4,000 pairs of shoes and boots Preserved fruits and pickles, dishes, guns, and knives, tools of all kinds, Indian trading bees, and even two prefabricated houses. And that is a snippet of the power that Herman brings to the state of Missouri. Thank you so much, Bobby. Your interpretation was wonderful, and we appreciate your special little shout out to Stonehill Winery. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. 
I am very excited to introduce our special guest today, uh, who is dressed up um, by uh, an interesting character in Herman's history and someone who has uh, very strong ties to Herman. Uh, retired parish pastor and storyteller Paul Schwartzkopf is joining us dressed as Carl Straley to tell us about the Civil War, the Bushwhackers, Edward Mule, and other Germans in the Herman area who worked from 1845 to 1865 to try and abolish slavery in Missouri. Guten Tag, wie geht es Ihnen? Ah, oh, you are English speaking visitors. We call you Yankees. You see, Herman was settled by German immigrants and is populated now by them and their children of German immigrants. Herman is sometimes called, therefore, Little Germany or Little Rhineland by Yankees. I am Carl Strage. My sister Pauline and I met Edward Meal in Cincinnati. We formed two partnerships. Edward and I became newspaper publisher partners, and Edward and Pauline became husband and wife. In 1843, we three moved from noisy Cincinnati to quiet Herman, where I bought this small house. Pauline and Edward bought a house on the other side of 2nd Street. The year is now 1865. I want to tell you briefly about the past 20 years, years in which we experienced a growth of freedom, truth, and justice. In 1845, Meal and I began to publish the Hermaner Volkenblatt, which in English means Herman Weekly Newspaper. German readers throughout the United States and Europe learned about Hermann by reading the Volkenbaum, uh, which contained editorials against slavery, written by Edward Meal, my partner. Meal was born in 1800 in Saxon, Germany. He studied at the University of Leipzig where he became active in the German Students Association, which stressed unity, freedom, and equality of all. Students in the association wore red hats. The red hats themselves became a symbol of freedom for all. Neil continued to proudly wear his red hat the rest of his life, and he urged everyone to work for freedom, truth, and justice for all. Beginning in 1845, Meal wrote against slavery. He argued that slavery was against the high principles on which the United States was established in the Declaration of Independence and the preamble of the Constitution. His opposition to slavery increased after the U.S. Congress in 1850 passed the Compromise Bill that said that new states in the West could decide for themselves whether they would be slave or free states. Then in 1851, the California State Legislature passed the Fugitive Slave Law, which said that escaped slaves must be returned to their owners. Neal was plainly angry and named the Fugitive Slave Law evil. Then he wrote in 1852, we did not escape slavery in our old homelands in order to support it here in America. 1852 was also the year that Harriet Beecher Stowe publi had published her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book was quickly translated into German and in 1853, Miel and I published it on the front page of the Hermanner Volkenblatt for 26 weeks. That was 26 issues to print the whole book. As early as 1851, Neil predicted that the issue of slavery 
would lead to civil war in this country. And the civil war, which was inevitable, did begin 10 years later in 1861. But before the war, Herman had another issue to deal with in 1854. It was cholera, a pandemic illness that made people very sick. There was no cure for cholera, so many people died. One of them on July 7th, 1854, was Edward Meal. He gave us this farewell. My whole life was dedicated to freedom. May you see freedom bloom more wonderfully than I have seen it. Meal's passion for freedom, truth, and justice lived on after his death. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, Thousands of German immigrants quickly answered President Lincoln's call for volunteers. These German-American freedom fighters were one of the main reasons that Missouri, which was a slave state, remained in the Union. Without Meal, in 1857, I sold the paper and the printing press to Joseph Graf, who continues to publish a weekly Herman newspaper. Thus, I exchanged the printing press for a wine press. Back in the 1840s, Meal encouraged people in Herman to plant grapes and make wine, since the soil and hills around Herman were good for growing grapes. And what do you do with grapes but make wine? This is the back of my house where I planted grapes in 1844. In 1857, I added the two-story addition. It held the wine press and everything else needed to make wine. I planted four acre, acres of grapes on a hillside east of town. Uh, two legacies from Meal live on winemaking, and working for freedom, truth, and justice for all. I will give you the example of two Herman men, George Hussman, who was referred to in the book as Uncle George, George Hussman and Charles Manwaring. Their wines are excellent, and their work to end slavery will live on after them. They worked in the newly formed Republican Party, to advocate the end of slavery and to help elect Abraham Lincoln as president in 1860. They placed ideals such as freedom, truth, and justice for all people above politics and personal preferences. They both served in the Union Army. But these war years have been very difficult in Missouri. There was no line between Confederate supporters and Union supporters. For example, Montgomery County, just north of the river from Herman, had more than 1,000 slaves. In contrast, Herman had no slaves and no slave owners. There was a problem for everybody. There was no place in Missouri that was safe from conflict. In the western part of the state, there were pro-Union anti-slavery groups called Jayhawkers who attacked pro-slavery people in western Missouri. And there were pro-Confederate pro-slavery groups called Bushwhackers throughout Missouri. There was no place safe we in Herman were really concerned and anxious about bushwhackers attacking Herman because Herman had a widespread reputation for being strongly against slavery. And sure enough, in May of 1864, bushwhackers attacked and killed Charles Manwaring on Wharf Street in downtown Herman. But his partner in the wine business, George Hoosman, continued the fight for freedom. Hoosman was a delegate to the Missouri Con Constitutional Convention in 1865 
and was the chair of the committee that wrote the law to end slavery in Missouri. The law was named the Ordinance Abolishing Slavery in Missouri. He signed it on January 11th, 1865 and said, this is the proudest day of my life. Now I say to you, work for freedom, truth and justice for all. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a wonderful interpretation of Carl Straley, and we were very glad to have you share the stories of Carl Straley and Edward Mule with us. Thank you so much. Now, if anybody has questions for, um, for us, uh, please feel free to put those in the comments and we'll answer them as they come up. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has registered in advance for this series. Uh, with each chapter, we wanted to um, host a little giveaway as our way of saying thank you to the people who registered um, and kind of signed up to, to get um, notified about this series and have um, been with us from the start. So our first winner will re our, our first winner received a copy of Growing Up with the River, the book by Dan and Connie Burkhart, which of course is the book that this program is based off of. Um, and then last week for our second program, uh, we awarded a baseball cap, uh, which was graciously donated by the St. Louis Zoo, which features the logo for their Native Foods, Native Peoples, Native Pollinators program. Now today, uh, we will randomly choose a name from our registration list to receive uh, a t-shirt. This uh, Katie Trail themed t-shirt uh, is made in a local print shop in Harmon, Missouri. Um, and we will pull a random name from that registration list and uh, get that t-shirt size and get the t-shirt ordered um, for that winner. And we will notify that person within the next several days. So uh, be sure to keep an eye out for your email because you might win this awesome t-shirt. Uh, if you would like to receive series updates, including the links to the videos, uh, the fun book activities we have planned for you kids and raffle prizes, um, visit mohumanities.org to look up more information about the Growing Up in the River program. Um, I don't see any questions or comments to uh, for us today, so I'll, I'll continue on. Um, I want to thank everyone that tuned in for our third chapter today about Herman in 1862. Uh, thanks so much to HEC TV for helping us present the program. Uh, and special thanks, of course, to Bobby Norfolk, who um, told the wonderful story of Herman, and then our guest speaker, Paul Schwartzkopf, dressed as Carl Straley, for telling us all about Herman. Um, our handout today, our special activity that we do each week, um, is a fun activity about Morse code. So um, chapter three mentions a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of different themes. So it was kind of hard to narrow down what to what kind of activity to make for you guys. But um, obviously, it talks about the Civil War. During the Civil War, uh, the telegraph became an important form of communication. Um, so to learn more about the telegraph, we created um, a little activity for you all. Um, so we will post that in the comments um, of this video thread on Facebook. So check back on our Facebook page shortly, and that'll be available. It'll also be available on our website, mohumanities.org. Um, so spend a couple minutes uh, deciphering our secret messages in Morse code. Um, and you can feel free to post your answers in the thread and uh, see how well you did deciphering Morse code. Um, thank you again so much. Um, I, I don't have any questions that have come up, so we'll go ahead and end there. If anybody does have questions after the program has concluded, go ahead and put them in the comment thread. And, um, you know, we, we monitor our Facebook page fairly regularly, so we'll be sure to, to get to those answers. Um, thank you so much for everybody who joined us. Uh, a reminder that we are here every week on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. until September 30th. Next week will be Chapter 4, New Haven. And we look forward to announcing our special storyteller and guests next week um, for chapter four. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful